I, I think it's time to start. So let's start. Welcome everyone. I'm Alok Mihani. I welcome you all on behalf of Flying Stories. Um, our today's guest is a widely successful serial XC mile muncher. In the past eight years, he has done a staggering number of 30,000 kilometers of cross-country flying. In 2018, he has flown a mind-boggling number of 4,100 kilometer flights in one season, which is the second best yet recorded on X contest. What makes it special? Uh, what makes him so special is he has a crazy string of successes at different sites across absurdly divergent weather conditions. He flew the B site record of 253 kilometers in 2016 with Debu. He has flown the biggest FAI triangles in Panjgani. And man, oh man, is he not fast? He has flown the second fastest 100 kilometers out and return XC flight at an average of 41.6 kilometers an hour in Kenya. He has also flown the second fastest 200 kilometer flat triangle at an average speed of 37.3 kilometers an hour in B. And a point to note, all of those crazy flights that he has done were all on END gliders and not triple C gliders. While his achievements might make you feel he's a special gift and or fearless, but that has not always been the case. He was once a pilot who kept bombing out 20 kilometers from the takeoff consistently. He used to have an irrational fear of flying over one kilometer of unlandable area. And even though with today's glide ratio, one could easily fly over with those. He took, he took up these failures as an opportunity to learn. As he realized his mind was the blog, studied the brain by putting in hundreds of hours of reading books, and thus started the journey of mastering his mind and rewiring his brain. This session is important to empower you to pick a direction, to know what you're going after. My dear pilots, to help us create a roadmap of training our mind, please help me in welcoming the speed machine, Freddie Barg. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Alok. So yeah, um, thanks for the great inter introduction. Um, um, I, I have a long, long, long um, slide uh, talk uh, in front of me. Um, I had only one week to prepare, but uh, it got longer and longer. So I think it's very interesting, um, not only for yeah your paragliding uh, career and skills, uh, also for your um, daily life um, or your business career. Um, a lot of the points that I will mention um, will will be very useful um, in all kind of situ situations. Um, I will start the talk with um, with some yeah some some brain myths that um, many many people think are true. Uh, just so you um, yeah get to the to reality fast and get a good brain model. And um, in the second part, um, I will go into uh, techniques you can apply to your flying and to your training. And um, yeah, um, a lot of those techniques uh, are from um, from my learning, uh, but other techniques are from uh, great pilots here in Switzerland, and um, they match nicely with, with with what I learned about about the brain and the psychology. Um, yeah, not surprisingly, uh, many of those uh, techniques come from Krikel Maurer, that had a, 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 a mental trainer with him in in his uh, early exalts um, uh, seasons. Um, so it's not surprising at all that he has uh, mastered those key techniques. Um, yeah, so let's start with the slides, I would say. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, paragliding, in my view, is is ninety percent at least uh, happening in your brain. Um, after you uh, got your key skills, your like thermaling, active flying, um, maybe a little bit of SIV. Uh, after you got that, um, everything else is is happening in your brain. Um, and um, the second quote uh, from Mario Adretti, uh, I think uh, it, it matches um, a, li a little bit how I uh, became uh, a force pilot. Um, you can't have everything under control all the time. It's impossible. Um, 
but yeah you have to go faster than that uh, but always like try to have the skills if something happens to 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 be able to to manage that but you it doesn't matter what your skill uh, of a pilot is and your your flying um um plans um you will never be 100 percent safe that that just um that just doesn't work out like that and it doesn't work out in in normal life as well so it's not not something only paragliding has the problem with oh um yeah Olok already mentioned all of this um i think we can skip skip that Go ahead, Freddy. Not all of this I have mentioned. <laughs> you didn't manage all of this. Oh no. yeah, um, I, I had after I decided. Uh, I started with um, um, with hiking flies and, and local hill flying and a little bit of acro at the beginning, and uh, I had um, yeah an injury from uh, hiking flies at one point, and. Um, after that, I started with cross-country flying. Um, yeah, one of the reasons was actually because uh, my food had to get better and it got better slowly. So uh, I decided to go cross-country because there um, the food isn't that big of a problem. Um, so, um, yeah, I started to uh, go cross-country flying and uh, since I started that about... I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago, something like that. Uh, since that, I had no injuries, no reserve rides, no tree landings. Um, yeah, I had a, a few scary moments uh, like all pilots have, but um, I was always able to manage them. And a lot of that has to do with how I manage risks and how I try to improve my skills. Um, I'm, yeah, when you look at this kind of flights and um, for us Euro European pilots uh, flying in beer with, with no rescue, um, with no good rescue uh, systems uh, like uh, helicopters that are at your place immediately or, or like 10 minutes after you ha had a crash, uh, this is completely different in, in, in beer. And... For a European pilot, that is um, not always easy. Um, it's even with, with having a reserve. Uh, if you land in a tree and there is nobody there for, for many, many kilometers and you're hanging there and no, nobody is, will come and, and, and save you. Uh, maybe somebody will come a day later uh, if, you're, if you're lucky. And same thing in Kenya, um, really, really turbulent area um, where you fly full bar 10 meters above the ridge um, to, um, yeah, to develop your, your uh, mental side to be able to do that without actually going to have a, a much riskier flight. So still being able to manage that uh, in, in, a, in a safe form. Uh, needs a lot of training in your in your physical skills in your in your muscle memory but it, um, a lot of that happens in your brain um, how you manage that and the, this talk is is about all those things so go back to the slides okay yeah why did i start meant um, uh, learning about mental training. Um, uh, Olok mentioned all these things. Um, I was really, um, I was a little bit frustrated at the beginning, uh, to be honest. Uh, um, I had that simple, uh, for me, cross country flying, uh, the mental model of that was pretty simple. You go from thermal to thermal, you glide. If it's getting rough, um, yeah, I was flying acro, I had no problem with that. Um, uh, but I learned fast that uh, that I had to improve my mental side and my uh, all my knowledge and where thermals forms and how valley wind winds works and, and and stuff like that. Um, so I I learned a lot um, not only about mental training but uh, all the 
information you can collect uh, about uh, cross-country flying and weather and stuff like that. And uh, it became, yeah, the most fascinating uh, rabbit hole of knowledge. Um, I'm, I'm learning this, uh, this uh, still, this stuff. Uh, every time I go on a solo hike, uh, I'm, I'm listening to audiobooks about this topic uh, because it's so fascinating. Um, and I hope it will be fascinating for some of you as well. Yeah, it's uh, eight years of study now. Um, over 200 books on the topic, uh, listening to podcasts on all my hikes, on my solo hikes. And uh, not only podcasts uh, and, and audiobooks, but the university lectures. Uh, there is um, the great courses that has amazing uh, professors teaching you about all this stuff. And it's super, super interesting and doesn't cost a lot. And it's just, it just takes a little bit of your time. And of course, talking uh, with top pilots, we, as you know, know for sure, uh, we have some of the best pilots here in Switzerland and they actually share their knowledge. And uh, it was very, very helpful to listen to them. And then just experimenting uh, on my own, what works, what doesn't. Um, let me move that to the side a little. Oh, it doesn't work. Yeah, why you should become your mental trainer. Um, you, you will not be able to afford one. Uh, that is probably true for most of us. It's not like in other uh, sports where the best pilots uh, can have their own mental trainer. Um, in Switzerland or, or internationally, it's probably uh, Crickle Maurer and, um, and the French team. Uh, the French team has a trainer, uh, but probably not many, many more. Um, it's just uh, the sport is way too small and uh, there's way too little money involved. So you have to become your own mental trainer. Uh, there's almost no way around it. Um, maybe you, you win the lottery and you can buy one, but uh, beside that you have no chance. So um, you have to learn it yourself. And this actually has advantages. Um, if, you, yeah, if you have a mental trainer um, and the mental trainer is not a pilot, um, he can only give you advice or checklists that you, um, that you use. Uh, and that actually doesn't make you yourself understand the topic. And if you understand the topic, you can uh, creatively um, apply those techniques. And um, yeah, like I mentioned, uh, my, my normal life beside paragliding, paragliding has improved as well from all of this. Um, it's very, very helpful in business. It's, it's helpful in, in many other things. So let's go through some brain myths, some popular brain myths. Um, for example, the 10% per, uh, brain usage. Um, if you know these movies, uh, Lucy, Limitless, Phenomenon, quite popular movies, they are, are, uh, are all based on the premise that, premise that um, your brain only uses like 10% uh, uh, of it uh, at any specific time. And um, yeah, that, this is completely wrong. Um, you see the, the brain scans there. And yeah, it looks on those brain, brain scans that, that we only use very, very little at, at a certain time. Um, this is uh, an illusion because those brain scans are, uh, are basically statistical variations to, to your normal brain state. And they are even more, they, they try to highlight only the areas that um, are um, as different as possible to your normal default brain state. And your normal default brain state is basically almost all your brain is active to a, to a certain degree. So um, yeah, seeing the, the, the differences, this can actually be a difference like this brain area is, is now active way less than it is normally. So you get the wrong image. And um, 
yeah, the public and the movie creators uh, got that image wrong. Uh, our brain uh, is is creating hallucinations all the time. Actually, everything you see, everything you hear, uh, all the memories are hallucinations. Um, you only you only experience them as hallucinations when when they're like um, uh, wrong if they don't match uh, reality. Um, and normally, the the, uh, the hallucinations the brain creates that don't match reality or, or normally filter it away. You only see the ones that uh, match reality. Uh, the, the thing is, um, our visual system and um, other sensory systems are, are not like, um, for example, the, videos, uh, the visual system is not like a video feed, not at all. You, you only see sharp in the center of your eyes. And uh, you have two blind spots on each eye. You um, everything away from the center is is blurry and in black and white, but you 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 don't see the reality like that. Uh, you see the hallucinations, the simulation your brain creates. Um, so yeah, hallucinations are not a defect. Um, it's 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 the normal state of your mind. Um, yeah, another uh, popular myth uh, is that you need 10,000 hours to master something. Uh, it, was, it was becoming very popular from uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers. Um, there, there have been, uh, I'm sure, thousands of articles of, uh, on this. And it's, uh, it's only a half truth. Um, uh, the, the, the scientist that found out about this, uh, Anders Ericsson, uh, he later wrote, wrote the book as well uh, about all of this and better read that book. It's, it's um, yeah, um, authors like Malcolm Gladwell, they, they write super, super nice books that are um, nice to read, nice, nice to listen to as an audio book. Um, but they oversimplify a lot of things. So if you have a chance, if, is, if you have a topic you want to learn about, um, and there is a book from, from a scientist that uh, works in that field, uh, try to read this, the, the book of the scientist. Because uh, the popular um, authors uh, get a lot of things wrong. Um, yeah, about those 10,000 hours. Um, yeah, um, it's it's dependent on the complexity of a task. Uh, if if the task is very simple, you can learn it in in a few hundred hours or even less, uh, and even master it. If a task is super complex, like um, paragliding certainly is, then ten hour ten thousand hours is just for for the start. Um, the the ten thousand hours actually. Um, uh, students that um, that uh, finished their study, and um, so they you can't really call them masters. Um, they are still at the beginning. They they can't creatively use uh, those skills. That uh, that takes maybe twenty thousand hours or more in a complex task or in a task that needs a lot of fine muscle memory. So with flying hours, you will have no chance at all to reach those 10,000 hours. Um, a way to overcome that is uh, use visualiz vis visualizations. Uh, but we will come later in a, in a further slide um, to a point how to, um, why 10,000 hours are not correct for our sport. Uh, while it's super complex, um, we actually have an advantage. Uh, I will come to that later. Um, yeah, um, next myth, um, we are not at all like a computer. Our brain is not like a computer. I uh, already mentioned the video feed illusion. Um, uh, we have no lossless storage. Um, and we actually, um, every time uh, we use a memory, um, we change that memory. Um, and um, because uh, our experience, our memories are not stored um, 
one to one. Um, we only store the interesting things in those memories. And for example, if you um, have an interesting experience with a friend and uh, the friend had, a, I don't know, um, a red T-shirt uh, on, on, on that experience, uh, but the ex interesting stuff had nothing to do with the T-shirt. So you, your brain doesn't store the red T-shirt. But when you memory, uh, when you remember that thing, um, then um, your brain um, creates that memory again, and uh, all the missing parts are just um, um, added with without the knowledge of, of of those actual parts. So maybe your friend has a a blue T-shirt in your memory because uh, he normally has a blue T-shirt. So. Uh, but you don't realize that this is a lie. This is a, a fake information. You don't realize that at all. Um, and your brain uh, has neurons like uh, machine learning and, and AIs on the computer, but um, it's mostly chemical and uh, only the transmission between or along the neurons is electrical. But most of, of your brain is actually chemical which makes the brain quite slow compared to, com com uh, to a computer, but it has other advantages. Uh, it's parallel mostly uh, and not serial like a computer. Um, you're using the, the same part for different things. Uh, so even the same neuron is, is used for completely different things. Um, your brain is not, um, um, I didn't list this here, but your brain is actually not software running on a hardware. It's hardware running uh, on a hardware. It's, 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 it's uh, what you think with is, uh, is always the hardware you, you're using. It's not a software that is stored somewhere and then executed. It's always, you, you always think with all the connections you have. Um, the brain has a surprising amount of computing power. It's just slow. Uh, but um, to, if you have to simulate all the connections in a brain, we are still not there. Even if we would use all the computing power of, of, that we have right now and combine that, it's still not there to, to, to simulate all the connections of the brain. Um, so it's kind of slow, uh, especially for like uh, uh, adding numbers or, or stuff like that. But uh, it's, um, yeah, if, if we want to simulate, it takes a lot of computing power. Um, then we don't have a, like a huge working memory like a computer. We can only store uh, three to seven pieces in, in our uh, working memory. And... Um, uh, everything we experience is is like um, in in a scope of between two hundred milliseconds and, and three seconds. If if nothing much happens, it can be um, your brain state is actually everything that happened in those three seconds. It's not like um, a smooth uh, thing. You experience it as smooth as something smooth, but that is an absolute an illusion uh, that can be measured. Um, yeah, we, we don't process data like a computer, we, we process change. Uh, we even reward that change with, uh, with dopamine. Um, yeah, blank slate. Um, we, we, we are not, um, like, um, was the, was, were people thinking maybe, I don't know, 50 years ago that, um, we can, create our brains in, in, in the way we want and everything connects in the brain uh, we want and what our experience uh, makes of it. Um, that is not true. Um, we have mostly a fixed st uh, structure. Um, our, our, even our pers personality type is mostly fixed. Uh, it's really hard to change that. Um, there is only one main area in the brain where new neurons are created. Uh, it's the hippocampus but that creates long-term memory. Um, 
yeah, and, and change happens mostly not by creating new neurons, uh, but by removing them or uh, optimizing the, the, the connections or between neurons. Yeah, it's not a design, uh, it's a evolved structure. So um, we have a lot of old parts that are uh, improved on, but are still basically the old parts. And um, evolution just built on top of it and uh, improved the old parts to be better. Um, yeah, many of the old parts are actually problems. Uh, they are not very well adapted for today's life and for paragliding. And uh, we have some really, really energy in inefficient uh, constructs. For example, we have neurons that, uh, and a lot of them that fire all the time. So use a lot of energy and, and they're actually active when they don't fire. So the difference is the important thing. And if you will con construct the brain, you will never have like uh, millions of neurons that fire all the time. It takes uh, an unbelievable amount of energy, uh, 20%. Even if you do almost nothing, it still takes 20%. Uh, the difference between being completely active, uh, focused on something or uh, solving a difficult problem and uh, doing nothing is, is, is surprisingly small, the energy uh, intake. Um, yeah, um, our subconscious brain, um, we, we have almost no access to that. Um, a lot of the decisions we make um, uh, originate in the subconscious brain. Uh, and our conscious brain um, thinks that um, uh, he made the, deci the decision, but that is an illusion uh, mostly. Uh, and we can measure that uh, in labs and in experiments. So often the, the decision to, for example, um, uh, push push a button uh, is made like half a second or up to two seconds, three seconds before our consciousness is aware of it. Um, so um, our subconscious brain uh, is is the big workhorse, um, not our consciousness brain. Uh, our consciousness brain, uh, the thing we actually um, experience our lives with. Um, is more like the CEO of a company. Uh, it makes uh, long-term decisions. It has maybe some veto uh, powers. So your subconsciousness um, makes a decision and you can overrule it. Uh, but even that, we are not completely sure about that. Um, and in between the, um, um, the subconscious brain and the, the consciousness uh, we have something called confabulation. Uh, it basically um, try, explains the, the decisions of the uh, subconscious brain uh, in a way that makes sense. So it creates a cause and effect and logic and all that stuff and tells you a story. Uh, so your subconscious brain makes decisions that you have no idea how they came and you're confabulator your storyteller uh, tells you why um, why that decision was made even if the the actual cause and effect in your subconsciousness is co completely different even if odd, completely other reasons uh, came to that com conclusion but you have that conf uh, confabulation you that storyteller uh, actually telling you uh, lying to you about why something happened um, and this is true for vision as well, for time, for memory, for pretty much everything. Um, another big myth is that you have uh, emotion blueprints for like um, anger, angerness or um, for good emotions, for all that stuff. Uh, we have words for all those things, but um, um, science has never found uh, emotion blueprints um, and we, uh, we are pretty sure now that um, that there are none uh, of those um, everybody of us has different emotions and they are created and they are created early in your life um, and you you can 
change them. Uh, we, we are coming to some techniques to change them uh, later. And um, yeah, you, if you know there, you can change your emotions and the meaning of them. That can be really powerful uh, for your flying and for managing fear and for managing um, yeah, um, scary situations. And uh, yeah, most pilots are probably uh, dopaminergic. That means uh, your dopamine system is is more active than in the in 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 an average person. That it's just um, yeah, one of the reasons we become paragliders, uh, our adventure and maybe a little bit risk risk taking um, um, view of things um, that brings you into the sport. And dopamine actually helps you uh, perform uh, well. We come to that, that later as well. Um, we are not completely rational beings, um, not at all. We have like uh, over 100 cognitive biases and heuristics. Um, uh, our subconscious brain um, is optimized to, um, to decide really, really fast. And for that, um, it uses um, simple heuristics. Uh, many of them are, are coming from our genes, from our past history as, as human beings. And they are not very well adapted to our today's lives. Uh, they are well adapted to hunter-gatherers, uh, to dangerous um, um, steps where you have animals that, that are dangerous to you but they are not very helpful uh, as, as modern human beings. And knowing about all of them, um, they are super, super interesting to learn about, by the way. And knowing about them can help you a lot. Um, you will identify situations during your flight, uh, later when you analyze your flights, um, where you can identify those, those, uh, those biases. And, when you know it about them, you can overcome them uh, to a certain point. Uh, even know it, knowing it about them, they, they still happen automatically and fast. So you have to overrule them. And that is not always easy. If you're in a stressed situation or a completely in flow, then um, your subconscious brain is, in, is, is doing 99% uh, of all things. So overruling them is not easy, even if you know about them. Uh, another uh, popular myth is that you have a left side and a right side, and one is more dominant. Um, the, the left and the right side of your brain is, um, has a, a super highway connecting them. And in a healthy uh, person, that connection is so strong and so fast that both brain sites uh, are acting like one brain. Um, you have connections between both sides, um, between parts of both sides that, uh, that are faster and ha have more bond bandwidth than other connections in, in the same side of the brain. So this is uh, absolutely an illusion that you, um, that you are like left side dominant or right side dominant. Your left side is always dominant because uh, it contains the language center and the confabulator. And that is the main thing driving you. And so the left, left side is always dominant. Um, there are still differences, of course. Um, some people um, are mo more open to what the, the, the right side, the more creative side um, um, brings to the picture. Uh, but that can be learned, um, and um, you can be more open to that. And but it's always like um, a giving and taking. So your um, right side co uh, is better at coming up with very weird and creative stuff, and your left side is much much better to to um, decide if those things are actually uh, useful or not. But uh, overall, it's, uh, your whole brain is, uh, is a combination of all your things. And thinking in left and side, uh, right side is not very helpful. 
And yeah, the confabulator that I mentioned it already is a story processor. So it creates stories all the time and you create stories all the time. And those stories actually shape your brain and how you, how you act and how you, how you learn things, how you uh, take in information. So um, telling yourself different stories can be really, really uh, positive to tell you the, uh, yourself the right stories. Uh, talent is uh, very overrated. Um, it helps you to reach a certain level faster. But because you reach that level uh, faster than other people, you never learned to uh, work hard on your, on your skills and or on, on improving yourself. Because you never learned that, uh, it's much harder for you to pick, overcome that first uh, uh, level, that first plateau. plateau. So uh, actually being less talented can be an, an uh, advantage because you learned uh, um, working with yourself, uh, training yourself, um, overcoming those plateaus that are lower than in a talented person, but you had to work hard on, on it. So you develop the skill to overcome them and um, becoming really, really good uh, means overcoming one plateau or plateau after another and improving yourself and this is actually easier if you are not that talented because you learned that um, there are exceptions of course um, uh, people that have such a high talent and such a high first plateau and maybe um, just a um, a way of thinking about things that they combine both things, having a big talent and uh, being able to overcome plateaus. And you will never reach those, uh, those, those levels because they, yeah, er every brain is different and you have a kind of maximum that you can achieve. Um, yeah, motivation is really, really important. Um, uh, all the time for talented people and for not so talented people. Um, it, it, it makes the big difference. Um, the amygdala is known as the fear center. Um, but um, yeah, it's only half true as well. Um, even people without an amygdala can, can experience fear. There are multiple pathways in our brains for different kinds of fear experiences and um, yeah people like Alex, Alex Honnold he was actually uh, put into an fMRI and uh, they looked at his amygdala and uh, his whole brain and if he experienced fear and or not or if his amygdala is different than in other people and his amygdala is pretty much the same as in most people uh, and he just um, learned how to overcome that fear to process it and to frame it in different different ways. Uh, never suppress your fears. Um, if you suppress your fear, uh, you lose connection to that memory. And if you lose connection to that memory, that memory that, and that um, that thinking process will still be there in your brain. You, your memory is not just some some file stored some, somewhere. You you're using your memories to think, and um, if you lose uh, connection to that memory, you have no chance to change it and to overcome a trauma, trauma traumatic situation. You have to know about that memory that created that that uh, situation that thinking process and um, so when you yeah have something a scary moment and you just um, yeah uh, forget about it uh, it can uh, bite you back and then you have no chance to actually at attack it again and, and solve it um, yeah the best thing is if you have um, uh, a scary situation use it as a as a learning experience try to analyze it and, and learn from it because um, scary situations are highly emotional and stuff that are highly emotional are, are more memorable so the 
the learnings out of the, uh, that are more memorable as well. So it's actually easier to learn things and faster if you use those, those fearful experiences to, uh, yeah, as a learning experience. Uh, if you can't find um, a learning out of something that is fearful, maybe talk with, with an expert pilot. Uh, maybe he can tell you how, how that could improve yourself. Um, the yeah, fight or flight response uh, is a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, it's actually fight or flight or freeze. And most people, um, there is research on this, uh, actually freeze. Uh, that's probably the reason why we fly into trees on landings. Uh, yeah, uh, it's it's good to know um, that um, yeah that we um, we have those um, those routines, those those automatisms. And if you know about that free situation that happens in a in a in a scary moment on landing, for example. Um, you can learn to overcome it. Um, and yeah, that, that free situation happens a lot, uh, not only by flying into trees or uh, uh, people spiraled into the ground because they freezed. Uh, um, it's, it's a very well-known uh, situation in paragliding. Um, yeah, maybe before I come to the mental mo model of the brain, um, this will, I think, not take as long as the, the myths. Uh, maybe if somebody has some, some questions already. Yeah, if people have questions, maybe you can ask right now. Um, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. And on questions on any of the myths that you might already know as well. Freddy covered a lot of those already. Okay, Freddy, I think we can move ahead. I do have a few okay. things, but I think we can cover those later during okay. the, yeah. Okay, the second break, good. Um, yeah, let's go on. Um, let's see. Um, next topic is uh, to, uh, should help you um, to form a, a better model of your brain. Um, I think the myths already, uh, explaining the myths already help you with that. Um, but there are a few things you should uh, know. Um, um, let's start with the binding problem. Um, all your sensory inputs, uh, like vision, um, sound, um, um, your sensory inputs on your on your hands, your your balance, stuff like that, um, that reaches your brain uh, in different speeds. Uh, for example, if you feel something in your ass, that takes uh, much longer to reach your brain than something you you hear, for example, that uh, hearing is very, very close to your brain. Um, then the, um, what makes uh, a difference as well is the, uh, how, how complex to process that information is. Uh, vision, for example, is, is super, super hard to process. So it takes longer till it can um, trigger some behavior. Um, and uh, while it's super close to your brain, it, it basically your eyes are directly connected to your brain, but it's, uh, it's hard to process, so it takes longer. Um, the, there is a discussion all the time it's with people. Um, some uh, tell you to look at the glider. If you, for example, gliding at full bar in a competition, like uh, uh, Russell Ogden uh, yesterday uh, in his uh, talk with Eximat Mac, in his interview, uh, mentioned that as well. Um, I'm not so sure about that uh, because um, while it reaches your eye really, really fast, uh, if, a, if a wing starts to collapse and it's very directly connected with your brain, um, the, the pr processing of it is very, very complex. And 
um, the feeling in your hands uh, is is in your in your brakes and on your riser uh, is probably faster to process for your brain. Uh, it's definitely faster to process for your brain. It reaches your brain a little bit later, but um, the processing is much 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 faster than the visual input. So I think um, he's probably wrong, <laughs> but um, yeah, maybe don't tell him. Um, but um, yeah, at the end uh, of the day, uh, use what works for you. Um, uh, the binding problem is so important because um, all these things uh, arrive in your, in your subconscious brain at different time points. And you have to combine that in some way. Um, some things maybe arrive after five milliseconds, other things arrive uh, after half a second. And um, if, if it's processed all at the same time, you have to wait half a second. And that, of course, can't work because uh, then you will be, be behind the reality uh, all the time by half a second. Uh, you, you will not be able to walk. Uh, and, and yeah, most of uh, doing most other things. And your brain solves this by um, having prediction networks. Uh, they may make predictions of the future and um, you have thousands of those networks uh, all your experiences all your memories um, form them and inform them and train them and um, the re result of those predictions is compared uh, against the current input and the winner is chosen so uh, the, it's like a competition in your brain uh, for um, which um, simulation, which prediction is the correct one. And this way, uh, you overcome that binding problem. Uh, so um, while everything arrives at different times, um, uh, because you're predicting the future, it's, it's still relevant uh, to act on it. So, yeah, if you, somebody tells you to live in the present, this is absolutely impossible at least when you um, look how the brain works. You always, your brain is always predicting the future. Uh, not very far into the future, just half a second or a second, but uh, it's always, always predicting the future. Um, and time is, is bundled that uh, it's, it's not um, uh, a smooth flow of those predictions. It's always like bundled into blocks of between tw uh, 200 milliseconds and three seconds. So if something is super complex, uh, your brain makes predictions for three sec seconds in, in, in advance. And you act on those predictions. So you're actually always living, uh, when something is complex, many seconds in, in the future, not in the present. Um, yeah, these prediction networks, um, they, all, they are not real time like in a computer. Uh, uh, even an, an AI uh, analyzing um, some visual input from a, from, from a video feed uh, is, is doing that in real time. Um, and the brain is different. Uh, the brain is too slow to analyze um, that in real time. So it has to do uh, to make those predictions. Uh, I think I mentioned most of that in the in the step before. Um, yeah, your consciousness is completely unaware of this process, and your confabulation network is 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 creating the the story, the cause and effect, and all the logic on that uh, on the winners. <laughs> but you're not, not aware of that process either. Either you 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 just get the result, the story uh, that the confabulator is telling you. Um, yeah, uh, the subconscious brain is, is very fast, uh, very en energy efficient, and highly biased. Uh, it's, it's, it's heuristics, basically. It, it tries to come to a fast result because it's so slow. It has, to, um, it has to be unprecise to come to the result fast enough. And that creates biases. Um, which um, we will talk a little bit later. Um, 
but yeah, you have to know that uh, your predictions are not, um, they, they don't try to be precise. They, they, they pri try to be fast, mostly. And um, your conscious pro processes are um, slower, uh, take up much more energy. Um, and uh, actually, if you use your conscious processes too much, uh, for example, in a 10 hour flight, you, you start to run out of energy. You, you have, if you ha have to do a lot of uh, difficult decisions in a flight, you have to eat more than in a flight where you, um, yeah, where you just have your automatism, your flow state, and you just go on. Um, yeah, consciousness uh, is, is very uh, important for planning stuff and uh, like statistical calculations are, can only be done uh, well in, in the conscious brain. So if you do a risk assessment of a decision, uh, it's a conscious process and it will take time, it will take energy um, and you have to be careful doing that during a flight. Uh, it's better to to work out those decisions uh, before the flight. So flight planning is is really really important. Uh, your instincts are very very useful, but only if you trained them well. Um, yeah, uh, your instincts is basically your subconscious brain. Uh, all those decision processes, all those um, predictions. And the better you train them, the better, the more useful they are to you uh, during your flight. So training is super, super important, and 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 collecting exp, uh, experiences and flying a lot. We are coming to that later. Um, to those cognitive biases, um, these are evolutionary adaptions. Uh, they are very, very well suited to uh, survive. Uh, in small groups uh, with uh, with dangerous animals, um, so they they are suited and optimized for that because evolution is a is, is a slow process, and since those times um, our brains have have uh, evolved very 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 little and uh, we, the I don't know the the two thousand years or ten thousand years of civilization. Uh, is not enough time to adapt our brain to 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 the, to our today's needs, and and of course not to the needs of paragliding. Um, a few of those uh, biases that are, that are important for us. Um, one is uh, loss aversion. Um, a good example for that is, for example, you you have a good day in beer where you can fly 200 kilometers or more. So you reach um, kilometer 65 or 70, and to fly further than 200 kilometers, you have to go further. But um, to go further, you fly into an area that is more stable, more windy, more difficult. And your loss aversion is telling you, your, your bias is telling you, um, hey, 200 kilometers is already nice. Let, let's return and make 200. Uh, but the day is probably uh, good for 250 uh, for a very good pilot. Uh, but your loss aversion is still telling you, hey, fly 200. Um, you, you bias. So you have to um, work on, on that to overcome that. Um, um, of course, sometimes loss aversion is the correct thing to happen. Um, um, it's sometimes it's better to return and, and not risk to bomb out and um, have your day over after, uh, after half the day. Um, but very often uh, the uh, loss aversion is actually wrong. And this is an adaptation, of course, from the, from the times you had to be safe from the dangerous animals. Uh, loss aversion was super good in the, those times. But uh, flying for records or for personal bests or whatever, uh, it's probably a bad thing. Um, the Dunning-Kruger effect is uh, when you learn about all these things here, um, uh, you realize that the more you learn, the more you know that you know very, very little. 
And this is true for most um, um, complex things and flying is definitely one of them. So the more you learn, the more you realize um, that you have to learn more and you, the more things you, you know you have to learn and improve. Um, at the beginning of your um, cross-country career, for example, uh, like it happened to me, you think it's quite simple. Um, and the longer you, you learn about it, the, the more you know it's super, super complicated. Um, and yeah, you, you never stop learning. Uh, inattentional blindness, um, something you're not focused on um, has a very, very hard time to get into your consciousness uh, because uh, your brain is basically um, deciding which uh, predictions to run based on your, on your fo uh, focus. Uh, so if you're uh, not focused uh, on catching birds turmoiling or, or trees shaking, you will have a hard time to, to see them. And to, to know, hey, there is a terminal. If you're not focused on, on looking for them, um, your brain will be occupied on, on terminaling or, or, or ma on managing your glider or on strategy. Uh, so you have to uh, point your focus to the right thing to, to have the right um, prediction networks running. Um, the contrast effect, uh, everything is relative. Um, for example, if you have a very turbulent day, um, yeah, you, have, you will be scared at the beginning of the flight, but then you get used to it. Um, the turbulences start to feel less uh, scary and you pushing bar more often and it just becomes easier. And knowing about that, um, you you can counter at, uh, attack that because if you uh, if if you become if it becomes too easy to you then maybe you you're flying too risky you can counter uh, that but the other the other way is true as well if you uh, if you have a, a, a mellow day at the beginning and then you have one rough thermal. Just remember the more turbulent day. It's the same thing. It's still easy, um, or or you can still manage it. Maybe it's not easy, but you can manage it. So you you don't get the fear when you know about this bias. Uh, another thing is uh, we see patterns everywhere. Um, that's just our normal way of of of, of how the brain, brain works. It sees patterns everywhere, even non-existing ones. Uh, this creates uh, bad data and noise, and um, our prediction networks you then use that bad data uh, to make predictions, and of course the predictions will be wrong. Uh, luck and randomness plays a much, much bigger role in, in, in our lives and in flying as well than we realize. Um, you, you can't um, make long-term decisions on something that only happened once. Like um, that thermal trigger is really rough. I don't go to that thermal trigger again. If you do that after the first time you were there, uh, it's, it's very bad data. You have to use that thermal trigger many times before you can be sure about that. Um, maybe you have a super good mental model and you know immediately why that thermal was rough. Then of course it's a different situation because it's then your your pattern pattern detection is is based on on very well formed data, but very often is uh, we base our predictions and our our thinking on 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 very few experiences, and this is a, this can be a problem. And yeah, correlation is not causation only because. Um, you flew to that place four times and the same thing happened there, doesn't mean um, you're, um, the, the reason why that happened is, is what you think. Um, um, it can have a completely different um, uh, cause. Okay, so I hope you have a, a little bit of a mental model now, um, how the brain works.
it was it was quite informative ready and it was quite good honestly um can we open up for questions now if there yeah, are any, if someone needs more understanding on one particular topic guys you can uh, go ahead if you need more information on any particular topic before we jump on to uh, use the techniques okay we have a question from kk um go ahead kk uh freddy you were speaking about uh, instincts and you know uh, making mm -hmm. our instincts better so when we talk about paragliding uh you know i uh, would you say there is a difference between judgment and instincts and if we were to you know uh, better our instincts how would we go about doing that um by uh, two things uh, by learning a lot so uh, when you learn about weather about um, about uh, wind systems about how thermals work uh, about fear about all those things um, um, you can better decide if uh, an instinct you had uh, is something that it was just a feeling um, that is not correct or you can uh, decide hey yeah that that's a good in instinct i should trust that and um, the other thing is just flying a lot um, flying a lot and analyzing your situations uh, helps uh, your instincts uh, become better um, all those biases uh, i talked about um, they can be informed um, you can't completely get rid of them but you you can like um, uh reduce the influence of them or or maybe uh increase the influence if that's helpful in in certain situations and it's yeah it's like a, a feedback process um uh, and in instincts happen all the time uh you should listen to them but maybe you should uh, at the beginning you should overrule them more often and uh yeah it's 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 a process it takes time at the beginning of your paragliding career you you can't really trust your instincts uh if you fly um like me i, I flew cross country i don't know three thousand hours or more um uh after a while you 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 start to trust them um but i still uh, i have areas where i don't trust them at all um that where I know uh, they are wrong, and um, I, I still to uh, still try to work on them. That maybe at some at some point uh, I can trust them. Okay, thank you so much. But it's a process; it takes time. Um, uh, originally, your instincts are coming from your from your genes, from your uh, surroundings, from from your culture, um, and from your human contacts and um for, yeah you for paragliding you you have to work on that okay uh, i'll think about it and maybe i'll get back to you again on this let me like okay. process this a little bit more yeah okay okay yeah. thank you so much for now and uh, next in line is nikhil nikhil please switch on your video and go ahead with your question hi uh, am i audible yes nikhil go ahead yes Okay, uh, so my question is: Can you elaborate a little bit on the relationship between the dopamine and the decision-making process? Just to give um, an example, uh, it could be um, a simple decision. Say, say for example, uh, maybe upgrading the class of the glider, or maybe opting out for an SI, uh, for an acro course, anything. So, I have noticed that okay. the thought process changes. Uh, right after the flight, I feel okay. Maybe I need a better glider, a higher class glider. I think I can handle it. But next mm -hmm. morning, I think, uh, no, I should be more pessimistic. So, which judgment okay. is more realistic? Can you elaborate more um, on the relationship? How dopamine okay. affects that? Yeah, uh, maybe a little bit on on how dopamine works. Uh, dopamine dopamine is um, released in the brain when you make uh, when your brain makes a prediction error. Um, 
And this is normally, yeah, when something is more scary than, than otherwise, or if something is more exciting than, than you thought it would be, uh, it's always those prediction errors, or, or you, maybe you have a super nice view, uh, and uh, that is a prediction error as well, you didn't expect it. Um, and um, your dopamine system helps you to, um, to reward the, that learning process. So when you force yourself to have more of those experiences that are unpredicted, uh, this happens with a glider that is more demanding than you're used to. For example, uh, it happens as well when you go, um, when you try new routes that you didn't fly before, then you have more prediction er errors. So you have more dopamine and with more dopamine, you learn faster. Um, so, I would say um, to, if you really want to learn fast, you have to be in an area that uh, creates a lot of those prediction errors. So uh, a glider that is more demanding to you, but still safe enough, uh, it, it doesn't help you if, you if you crash because then you get a trauma or something worse. Um, so you, it's best to be in an area that you still have on the control to some, to some measure. But that is, um, that is uh, like challenging to you, that forces you to learn. And where you have those dopamine um, uh, releases more often. Did that help? Uh, yeah, that kind, of, that kind of touches all the areas. My question is more about the decision making process. It completely uh -huh. switches, it's completely polarized. Say if I'm thinking of A, Right after the flight, I will think completely opposite. And okay. after the dopamine is gone, yeah. I would think back, come back to the pessimistic um, yeah. decision. The, so which the one thing is, is trust? The thing is, your, your brain is controlled by chemicals a lot. So when you have a dopamine release, uh, your brain works differently than when you have no release, when you are relaxed. Uh, so your decision making and your, your thinking changes as well. That's just normal. Um, and knowing about that is uh, can help you to uh, yeah to know that for example i had uh, i'm always nervous because uh, before of before the takeoff uh, not because i could crash uh, uh, more because i could bomb out because yeah on cross country flights you normally take off very early um, and you, when you bomb out early, you lose like two hours till you're at the takeoff again, and then your big plan is over. So um, I know this is a problem for me. So, um, and in that situation, of course, I'm nervous. I have more chemicals in my brain. And I learned to, uh, to override that with, with my conscious brain. I just know uh, in, yeah, 95% of all cases, um, taking off at this, time it will be okay it's it's it makes me nervous but it will be okay so i just overrule that uh, knowing about those situations uh, helps you and and how those situations work got it thanks a lot okay um i uh, next in line is bushan bushan go ahead please switch on your video bushan uh hey uh freddy uh Hi, uh, I'm Bhushan. Hi. I'm a relatively a new pilot, and I want to thank you for taking up uh, this topic. And which is, uh, you know, I feel uh, every single line of uh, of your topic and uh, or the course until now uh, has been has been absolutely a topic in itself. And I'm all the more glad yeah. because a book that I'm reading right now draws uh, very parallel inferences. I guess uh, it's also a source for uh, a lot of the things that you have discussed. Sapiens, uh, from which I see cognitive bias and uh, not enough time for human brain to evolve uh, uh, to where we are right now, 10,000 years yes. being a very short time and stuff like that. So yes. uh, on similar lines, uh, I find an interesting uh, you know, topic in the book, which is also relevant to paragliding and progression of paragliding. That is uh, making a series of decisions which seem right at the time. But in, in, uh, in retrospect, those may not have been the best decisions in our own interest. So uh, just to draw a reference uh, in Sapiens, uh, he says when hunters and gatherers settled, 
and made decisions of putting in more and more effort uh, into agricultural uh, revolution. Uh, those uh, changes seemed fine at that time, spending more time in the fields, uh, building, you know, uh, machines or, you know, tools to uh, spend all the more time mm -hmm. and get more efficient in uh, farming and stuff. But eventually we ended up where, uh, where quality of life versus the effort uh, did not really seem that, that great of a deal uh, for sapiens. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, so my question here is, how do we, uh, from, uh, from beginning stages in paragliding, uh, try and look at the bigger picture and plan towards it, rather than discover after four or five years of progression that uh, these steps that we took, maybe handling fear or handling risk threshold, were really not uh, in the best interest. Uh, I'd really appreciate if you could touch upon that. I have few more yeah. in this series, so if unless uh, Bhushan, it's short, okay, can... just stick to the question, Bhushan. Oh, it was really <laughs> difficult to ask this question in short. Maybe Freddie can, yeah. uh, you know, back me up on this. Yeah. It's it's not possible. It's really a deep uh, yeah. topic. It's uh, I'm sorry, it's not possible. Any yeah. brief. Maybe I can type the questions later if I'm yeah. uh, causing too the much thing of. Is, uh, yeah. Yes, please. The thing is, uh, you your sub subconscious brain and, and all those uh, biases and heuristics. They, they have a lot of power over you and um, overruling them is almost impossible and, um, and it just takes time. Um, you can't force that. And um, you, you need flying hours, you need experience, you need to learn about these things, uh, analyze yourself, analyze your flights to, to be able to suppress them or overcome them or or frame them, use them in different ways. Um, uh, a few of those biases can be super, um, super useful um, if you use them in the in the right way. But it it takes time. Um, yeah, uh, I I, ca I can't make it faster for you. I can just yeah read the right books and and maybe I have a big reading list uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, with some some books that go into details, um, and um, yeah, all these biases. There there is a, a podcast as well that explains all these biases and um, how we can uh, work around them. Um, yeah, it's it's just a learning process. It it takes time. Does it answer your question, Bhushan? Uh, Yes, it does. Maybe I'll just ask one short question uh, to close it from my side. Uh, that is, uh, people start from different, uh, uh, from their own benchmark levels, like my threshold, yes. this threshold, safety threshold might be, uh, and will probably be very different from Alok's and uh, yours, Freddy's. And uh, we are supposed to, uh, you know, uh, come up to a certain level where we can go ahead, progressing in the right direction with the right steps, with healthy yes. uh, incremental so of uh, of the of the threshold and capacity so can you talk a little bit about that uh, from people at different levels coming up to a certain uh, certain common standard and then progressing from there or yeah. everybody has to progress with their own uh, with their own scale yeah. all the time everybody has to progress with their own own, own uh, speed um, there's no way, no way around this um, there are people that are naturally faster at at, at learning at, at, at changing your brain, at adapting. Um, culture plays a big role. Your pers personality type plays a big role. And you, uh, it's almost impossible to, to change a personality type. Um, but it can be an advantage to you if you learn, if you um, go for it uh, slower. Um, it can, uh, can be an ad advantage as well as you maybe learn things that other just jump over because um, it's just um, like um, they don't care about it, for example, um, that you need to actually analyze uh, to overcome them. This can help you in the future. And, and uh, that's, it's like with, with, that, um, with that slide with, with the talent. Um, it may take longer for you to reach a certain level but because you had to work harder on it, it's it's after that it's it's easier for you to to improve. Because you already have the the learning process, you know you have to to invest time and 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 learn all these things um, to make it work for you. 
Uh, thanks a lot, Freddie. Uh, next question. Uh, next question is from Clint. This will be the last question. Uh, we will take other other questions at the end of the session. Then. Hey, Freddie. Uh, so, so you mentioned about uh, the predictions. Uh, what brain makes, especially unconsciously. So, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, especially in Acro, we tend to visualize a lot of maneuvers even before doing that, and even tend to see a lot of videos uh, even before doing those maneuvers. And when mm -hmm. you're actually doing it, you feel you were before. Uh, that you know at that point before yes, that yes. so and and at the same time there are a lot of guys who tend to watch you know accident videos a lot of you know uh, mm -hmm. really bad videos so does yeah. these affect the predictions what main brain makes unconsciously do you think yes of course uh, visualization is a, a really group code method to improve yourself uh, you still have to do it in in real life uh, after visualization but um yeah, visualization um, helps you a lot. Um, it has been shown that um, uh, hours spent in visualization, visualization something uh, is like, I, I can't remember the percentage, but it's quite a high percentage of the real thing. And um, yeah, um, in paragliding, we, we only fly maybe, I mean, I fly 300 hours or uh, sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more per year. Um, but that's, of course, very, very little. Uh, so if you spend time at home uh, visualizing stuff or like using uh, another pilot's flight to, um, uh, to fly with him, to, to inspect a, a, a route or in, in acro flying, uh, you, you watch the videos. And um, learn from them. Uh, that's very, very helpful. Um, um, for example, I watch all those uh, accident videos, um, all of them. Um, I learn to to um, to um, process them without uh, triggering uh, uh, irrational fears. Uh, I try to learn from them and and use them as 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 knowledge to to not crash myself. Um, I, I never felt like they, they would uh, create un unnecessary fears in me, uh, not at all. Okay, and do you think at the same time when you watch too much of accident or you know, negative videos, it will influence uh, the subconscious minds in a negative way? Mm, only if you process that in the wrong way. Um, uh, okay. If you if you if you're telling your brain, uh, hey, this is important, and uh, and this is the thing we learn from that video, then then it's okay. Um, uh, what you shouldn't do is, uh, like, like I already mentioned, uh, maybe as an example, um, I think that was two years ago. Um, I was flying uh, after a long flight. I was flying back at uh, on the Monday Ridge, and at kilometer thirty. Um, I, I suddenly got into a lee side because um, probably the the hill that is a little bit on the outside uh, had a big thermal lifting away. So I was not soaring the, the ridge anymore. I was completely in the lee side. Uh, that happened uh, pretty low and from one moment to the other. And um, yeah, uh, I, I got out of it. Uh, I, I mean, I got a full bar 80% collapse or 70% collapse. On a, on a D glider. Um, I got a cravat immediately. Um, I stalled the cravat out and um, I had to let it fly immediately again to, to get away from the hill. I had maybe, I don't know, 30 meters above the hill. And um, in, in, after I, I, I flew away from this, uh, I, of course, I had a lot of adrenaline in me, um, but um, I immediately started to process that uh, experience. I, I tried to find out what was the reason that happened. Um, was it something I could ever control? And if not, um, uh, was there maybe a better reaction than my immediately stalling the glider? Um, and what I uh, took away from that, uh, that happened during flying back, uh, I immediately uh, do, did it uh, in those, I don't know, one and a half hour till, till I landed. Um, was that I never um, that I was never thinking about uh, throwing the reserve. 
uh, when it happened, there was 100 meters above the ground, and um, I was in shitty, shitty air. And uh, not for one moment I was thinking about throwing the reserve. And um, that was my learning on the way back, that I, uh, that I had too many uh, good flights in the past years, and um, I, had, I have maybe on, on the Sino, for example, I had one big collapse in 600 hours. So um, I, I got to use, I, I got way too used to nothing happens and to, I completely forgot the reserve. And so on the way back, I, 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 I started that learning process to, to look where the reserve is, to actually make the decisions to throw the reserve when something happens again. And so um, uh, after I landed, um, I had a learning experience and uh, I didn't have a trauma or, or something like that. Um, and it was completely okay. I, uh, for me, it was uh, a very good thing to happen. <laughs> um, it would be bad if I didn't survive that, but um, um, because I survived, I got a big uh, learning ex experience. Brilliant, thanks a lot, Freddy. Freddy, I think we should move ahead with the session. There are more questions coming in, but we'll take those at the end now. Okay. Okay. So let's get to the interesting paragliding related stuff. So, um, yeah, the first thing you need is a really, really good fundament. Um, you have to be healthy. Um, you don't have to be super, super um, athletic or anything like that, but you have to be healthy. Uh, you need to have a certain kind of fitness because um, uh, if you get tired or at, to the limit of your body, um, your decision process will be slower and um, will make more more mistakes. Um, if you want to learn something, uh, try to avoid uh, drinking alcohol before you go to bed. Um, sleep for at least eight hours. Uh, your brain actually learns uh, while you sleep. Um, it's it's a great thing, a great practice to um, to learn something new before you go to sleep. Um, you you. Your sleep uh, is processing that. Uh, your, your brain is processing that during the, the sleep. And um, if you want to be able to make creative decisions during a flight, uh, you need those eight hours because um, uh, REM sleep is, is thought of to be really important for that process. So uh, the, the biggest uh, um, the longest REM sleep part is at the end of those eight hours. So if you wake up after six hours or seven hours, uh, you don't have that part of your REM sleep. And that uh, makes your uh, creativity uh, worse. So try to be healthy and sleep enough. Uh, try to remove death from the equation. Um, that means um, you, you're not trying to risk your life, but um, you shouldn't be scared of death because otherwise that will play a huge role in your decisions and you will never um, uh, advance uh, uh, far enough. And actually removing death uh, from the equation um, makes it more likely that you will not panic and panic is not good. Um, in a, if you panic in a situation, you, you're doing the wrong things. So if you remove death for, from the equation, you actually fly safer uh, because you're more relaxed in like the situation I, I told you in uh, with my collapse low, uh, low to the ground. Um, uh, yeah, it, it just focuses you more if you don't think about dying um, and you're in the right yeah, uh, brain state to process and to solve something. So yeah, I, I can't tell you how to remove death from the equation. Uh, for me, it's just, um, I'm an atheist. Uh, and for me, when I die, it, there will be nothing left of me. So um, yeah, I don't have to worry. <laughs> uh, 
uh, if I die, I, I, I will not be in any position to worry about the thing I did wrong. So death doesn't count really. Um, for you, it's, um, it's probably something else. Uh, it's, this is completely personal. Uh, I can't make that decision for you. Um, ignorance is not bliss in the sport. Um, you have to learn a lot because that makes you safer, that makes you better. Um, this is just the case. Um, and this is the fundament you need. Um, if you just go blind through this sport, uh, it, it will get you at some point. You, you may be advanced faster at the beginning, but uh, it will catch up to you. Uh, flying hours um, is super, super important. Um, uh, try to um, yeah, have long stretches of, of, of flying every day and flying stuff that uh, challenges you. Um, this, this is a, a huge uh, advantage if you can do that. Uh, I've seen that in myself. I've seen that, seen that in many other pilots. Uh, they were at a place like Beer or Kenya or Australia or, or, or Brazil where they could fly every day. And every day was long flights, challenging flights. Uh, if you have that for one month or, or even longer, uh, you, it's, it's, it's something that you can't replace with, with anything else. Um, p uh, pilots just improve massively after, uh, after vacations like that. Um, yeah, don't get occupied by things you can't control. Um, um, yeah, we are, we are making, um, an issue of things uh, we, we can't control all the time. And you have to learn to get rid of that. Um, there is always a risk in our sport, as is walking over the road and showering and whatever. Um, try to improve your skills, but you will never be 100% safe. It uh, doesn't matter what you do. Uh, you can't change the weather, uh, make the best out of it. Um, yeah, if the day starts super, super nice and you think you can fly um, 200 kilometers or more or maybe even go for the record and then the weather changes, maybe it starts to overdevelop too fast or wind picks up or whatever, um, try, try to um, just uh, ignore it or, or make the best out of it, not, not ignore it, make the best out of it. Uh, and and. Don't get angry about that. Um, that's just normal. Um, it happens all the time. Um, I have three ex uh, examples here uh, from my experiences. Um, uh, on one flight in Kenya, uh, I pushed my condom away uh, in the first hour of the flight. And because I was, um, I was prepared to pee a lot on that flight, it's, it's super hot in Kenya, um, I... I really had to pee after two hours. I really had to pee hard, but I just pushed through it. I tried to ignore it and I flew 271 kilometers on that flight. And after I landed, I didn't even have to pee immediately. I, I, I packed my glider uh, and then walked to a, to a tree and peed. Um, you, your body uh, can do more than you think uh, it can do. Uh, and even the pain that started after two hours uh, was gone after three or four hours. So yeah, it takes some willpower to get through that. But uh, if a day is as good as that day was, um, there are good, good reasons to go through it. Um, yeah, maybe if I would be a doctor, I would not um, tell you that, but... Uh, <laughs> I heard of uh, some different experiences with peeing, but um, yeah. Uh, yeah, on one flight, uh, my uh, speed bar, uh, the, the rubber that pulls back your speed bar uh, broke. So I was flying the wall 200 kilometers with a, with a bent knee while terminaling. Um, because I, I, it took me like five minutes to, to grab the, the speed bar. And uh, then I didn't want to go, go uh, let it go away again. And uh, I had a bent knee all the time. 
Uh, I got cramps at the end of the flight, but it was worth it. Uh, another good example was uh, the, the, the speed bar completely broke. Uh, and uh, I flew out into the flats at Dharamshala because it was overdeveloping. And I didn't want to fly below the overdevelopment without the speed bar. So I flew out into the flats and, um, and, uh, and I had lived there till Dharamshala, uh, till Bir, till the landing. And I lost maybe 300 meters between Dharamshala and, and Bir uh, in those 45 kilometers without turning once. I, I turned once to make a video. <laughs> but uh, it was just uh, lifty air all the time and it was super nice. Uh, repetition is really, really important. Um, it, it, it's what, what's making your brain learn. Uh, if you read a book and it's a super, super good book, uh, read it twice or even more because that actually helps you learn. Uh, same is, of course, with all the experience you, you collect. Uh, if you repeat it and if you analyze it in between, you learn a lot more. Um, your prediction networks are uh, are informed by that, those repetitions. Um, if, uh, if a prediction rep, uh, network formed and then is never used, uh, it will disappear again. And, uh, repetition is what, what makes those networks better, better optimized. Your, your muscle memory is, is the same thing, it's in your brain. Uh, the more you do something, the better your muscle memory will become. Your active flying and your your timing in acro and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, it may be super, super boring to, to cross the valley uh, dozens of times, the same valley, but it's a super nice learning experience. You don't have to go for a record or rest results or points all the time. You, 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 if you can choose a very good day and just to try to uh, improve your big valley crossing. Uh, so you cross that 10 kilometer valley 20 times in a day. You will not get a lot of points, but uh, you, it will help you in, in the future to, to, um, on, on all your valley crossings. Maybe you learn that you can go lower or you found new trigger points in the, in the not, so, not sunny side. Um, uh, it just teaches you your skills and your, your uh, knowledge of things. Uh, don't blindly make those repetitions. Um, be be focused on them. Uh, if you if you just if you are bored, it doesn't help you. Uh, you you have to set yourself a, a goal and try to improve and analyze your um, your repetitions and improve on them. Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't. It shouldn't be boring. It it should be f uh, something that is challenging you. So, those valley crossings. Uh, try to lose altitude and uh, cross that valley two hundred meters lower than you normally would, and and try to see if that still works. And maybe you have to grab yourself out. Maybe you have to tumble in shitty air. Um, can happen. Uh, but then you learn from that, and you learn that. Um, that it's still possible to make that valley crossing with that altitude, but it is hard work at the other side. Um, maybe it's super easy. Maybe uh, 200 meters lower, it's still super easy, and you never, uh, you never thought that that's the case. And uh, it makes a faster line or, or improves your flight in in another way. Uh, always be brutally honest to yourself. Um, if you if you lie to yourself, you're you're creating bad data. You're creating noise. You're informing your predictions the wrong way. Um, you should always be super brutally honest to yourself. If you made a mistake, um, you made a mistake. Be honest about it and learn something from it. We all do mistakes. Um, I do mistakes on my flights all the time. Um, if you just, yeah, if you're not honest, if you just push it away, uh, an experience, um, you, you lose connection to it and you create the trauma that I already mentioned. And that can be impossible to, to remove. Uh, it, can, it can bite you again and again. You, you feel the, 
the scary thing coming up again and again, and you have no way to remove it. So always be brutally honest. Um, um, don't try to push away something that is scary to you. Um, if you have a flying partner, um, be honest to him as well. You learn faster uh, if you do that, if you, both of you do that. If, you, if something has scared you, uh, tell him that. Maybe he has a solution for you. Or maybe he knows why it, it wasn't scary at all. Um, try to not remove sensory input. Um, maybe the, the NOAA designer that we have later in one of the talks will, will not approve this. But um, try to uh, fly a wing that is not too dampened that um, tells you what the air is doing. Uh, you maybe get, get nervous when you fly that wing first, um, but um, you get better information from, from the air. Uh, of course, it shouldn't show you uh, information that is useless. Uh, there are some wings, um, one that I flew last year, uh, not mine. Uh, uh, that was super nervous for the for the category and showed stuff that was completely useless. That can happen, um, and that doesn't mean mean it has to be a a, a very soft glider. Uh, even even a wing like the Sino that is uh, yeah that is very collapse resistant and very coherent in the structure can tell you a lot. Um, uh, but there are better wings than the Sino uh, that tell you more. Uh, but yeah, try to find a wing that tells you the right things and tells you a lot of those things or, or enough of those things that your brain can, can learn from it and can tell you where the thermal is going up or uh, what kind of turbulence this is, stuff like that. Um, I, yeah, I always did that. I could never fly with a full face helmet um, because I have to hear the noises of the wind. Um, I just heard Crickle mentioning the same in his talk or in his interview with, um, with XCMAC. Um, yeah, for me, that's super impo important to hear the wind. Um, Another good thing is uh, try to uh, work on your balance uh, in your non-flying days. Uh, uh, balance is a very, very important sensory input. Uh, you can learn a lot with a, with a glider that shows you over, through the risers, through the, through the harness, what the air is doing. Uh, I prefer that to, um, to a system that is blocked or that is very stable. Uh, because, yeah, you can learn from those informations. Um, yeah, this is the first, like, real technique that is, um, uh, it actually comes from scientists. They discovered this uh, method and proved in, in studies that this actually works. Um, the idea is to, um, um, to think of something that is challenging uh, but doable that will maybe take you uh, one year or two years uh, to to realize to 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 make possible uh, then you have to really dream of that situation for example flying a record in beer or maybe it's flying your first 100 kilometer in beer or something like that you really have to uh, try to dream of the outcome of when that happens really to, to try to visualize it and, and feel the the happiness in you when after that flight that's important but then the more important thing is uh, find all the obstacles that are in the way of of realizing that dream um, and and break them down into small obstacles in small things you have to improve on yourself and uh, in things you have to first um, find out on, on that course. Maybe you, you have to um, go one ridge further on each flight and figure out how that works. And uh, you have to like take that dream and, and bring it down to uh, something realistic. 
both things are super important. The dream is important and making it something realistic that is um, that needs effort to get there. Uh, yeah, and plan all overcoming all those obstacles. And what happens when you do that is you have uh, something in your subconsciousness that is pulling you, motivating you to that future. Uh, if something feels uh, uh, was like a, a chore, something was um, boring or something was um, just hard work to overcome before, before you did that, when you know this is an obstacle to that dream, uh, it will be much more motivating to overcome that and to work on it. Uh, it's really, it, it makes that motivation is actually improving your willpower and you uh, actually everything, it, everything will become easier uh, working on that. But you have to do both things. You have to dream first and you have to identify uh, on all, the, uh, all those obstacles. Otherwise, if you just dream of it, um, your brain thinks, ah, oh, great, um, um, I had the happy, happy moment already. I already did it somehow. Um, and then you have zero motivation to work on the obstacles. Uh, the other thing is um, the skill bubble. Uh, I, I learned about this uh, from, a, um, from a talk that a famous uh, mountain biker gave. Um, I, I can't even remember the name. Uh, he was doing absolutely crazy mountain routes that were super, were super, super exposed. And uh, he told in that interview uh, how, how he works on his skill bubble. So ba basically everything you learn, uh, every skill you, you, um, you work on uh, improves, makes that bubble bigger. And um, with a bigger bu bubble, um, uh, you, you get more protected from everything that is thrown at you. Uh, for example, uh, turbulent turbos, thermals, uh, too much wind, um, no landing areas, whatever. Um, all your skills, all the knowledge you collect uh, will, inc will make that bubble bigger. And all those difficult things will be uh, easier for you to, to handle the bigger that bubble is. You, you're, like, you're increasing your... your, um, your your spectrum of things you can uh, safely do. Um, and you, the more you work, um, like focused, uh, conscious work on that bubble, the, the better you know where your limits are. Uh, so you, you can go closer to those limits. To, you can, closer, uh, can go closer to that, the, the, the end of that bubble that is protecting you. Um, and the bubble uh, starts to shrink again when you when you don't work on on those certain things. So you always have it's it's not a constant thing. It's like it's like an art. You you're constantly identifying uh, parts of that bubble that are 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 closer to you. So you have to work on them to to push them out again. And the bubble should be yeah like a circle. Um, you have things you have uh, that are super easy to you. You don't have to work hard on them. Uh, they're always far out. The bubble there is always far out. But uh, you have other things that you have to work super, super hard. And uh, a good pilot has a bubble that is, uh, that is reasonably good in all the things. And um, so you're pr protected from all the, all the things that could happen. Did this it doesn't have to be something dangerous. This can be something that just makes you uh, land early or, or land um, or fly into an area that has no thermals or whatever. Um, but yeah, uh, try to think of that bubble that is ar around you and try to make that bubble bigger. It's, 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 it's a visual technique that can really improve working on yourself. Uh, yeah, the next thing is flow. Um, you probably experienced this already. Um, I experience this all the time when I fly. Um, it's basically um, the experience where you are so completely focused 
that uh, the normal chatter that is going on in your mind is completely gone. You you often land after a flight like that, and uh, you you feel like uh, in a way uh, the the flight was very short, but uh, sometimes a, or or even very long sometimes. But you it was like that super nice experience. Uh, you, it was the, that automatism that was running. It, it's basically your subconsciousness doing everything perfectly. Um, and yeah, when you are in that flow state, in that optimal performance state, you actually learn faster as well. Your subconsciousness uh, improves all those prediction networks and your muscle memory much, much faster than if you are in a, in, a, in a state where you have your chatty mind uh, that is influencing you all the time. Uh, it, it, it actually, uh, coming back to those 10,000 hours, um, the more you are in that uh, flow state, the faster you learn and the, the, uh, the less hours you need. So maybe it's not 10,000 10, hours when you're uh, often in that flow state, maybe it's only 4,000 hours or 2,000 hours. Um, Krigel Maurer is probably close to those 10,000 hours, but he has probably mastered this whole thing uh, at 4,000 hours, no idea. Um, because he is like pushing himself to, to be close to that or in that flow state or close to that flow state uh, very often. Um, there is a downside to the flow state. Um, um, the flow state is basically your subconscious mind uh, working perfectly. Um, but uh, as you learned, your subconscious mind has a, a lot of biases, uh, things that are not very well suited. Uh, it, that improves with your experience and with your working on those things. But um, for certain things, uh, your con uh, subconsciousness uh, is just not well suited for it. Um, uh, one main thing is, is strategic, uh, strategic uh, decision making. Um, so, uh, if you have to make a long term decision, uh, um, yeah, your flow state is not a good um, good place to 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 make them. Uh, it's almost impossible to make them in the flow state. So, uh, what can help with that is set yourself self trigger points. For example, before a big valley crossing, set yourself a trigger point to go to get out of that flow state, to make the decision: Hey, do I make this valley crossing now? Uh, can I make enough altitude to make that crossing? And after you make made that decision, you you try to go into that flow state again, and you need to set those triggers in advance. Um, the, this happened to me early in the in the flying in the cross country career a few times, uh, especially on days that were super super thermic. So I was extremely focused on flying. Uh, I was in that flow state, but then I missed um, a few, uh, yeah, valley crossings where I just, yeah, uh, the thermal got slower or I I, I I did fall out of the thermal and I was just going over that valley. Which uh, yeah, have, which landed me a few times on on very very good days. <laughs> um, you have to define those triggers in advance, uh, otherwise you will not get uh, out of the flow state. Um, sometimes you have a hard time to get into that flow state. Um, if if for example if it's very turbulent and it scares you. Um, what I try to do in, in moments like that is um, I, sometimes I start singing, sometimes I, I just come up with uh, funny domain names, for example, <laughs> that happened to me on a few flights. Uh, the, the idea is to occupy your conscious brain, your, 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 um, your reason-making brain uh, with something that is um, simple, that doesn't need your subconscious brain. And then your subconscious brain can can uh, do its job and, and work optimally. Um, this I learned from Krigel Maurer. Um, he he splits everything into modes, in, into flying modes, into tasks. Um, 
This can be tourmaline, for example, gliding, power soaring, dolphin flying, um, looking out for turmoils, looking out for birds flying, stuff like that. Um, these are small tasks where he is com completely concentrated on, on, on that task, on those tasks. And um, he uh, um, and you should train those those tasks on 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 days where it's yeah where that you use for training. Um, and um, you have to train switching between those tasks. So for me, for example, when when a terminal gets uh, slower, I, I uh, that triggers the. Uh, the decision making process for me to decide hey should I stay in this terminal or should I go on um, and this triggers you have to work on those you you have to define those triggers and make those decisions uh, in advance because otherwise um, uh, you will not switch uh, between those tasks not optimally uh, but yeah you have to attack those uh, different modes uh, all on their own then you learn learn them and practice them. Um, yeah, I, in a on a on a training uh, flight, um, um, this can be a very good day sometimes. Um, uh, but uh, there are days where I'm just interesting interested in learning, um, or sometimes even on on big days, I I try to um, concentrate on on improving my terminal uh, in each terminal. And, and analyzing why something didn't work and in each terminal. Uh, this will sometimes uh, make my climb much worse uh, because I'm trying out new things. Uh, but uh, in the long run, that will improve your flying a lot. Uh, the same for all the other different tasks and modes. Uh, you have to practice them and work on them. Um, yeah. That's this thing. Um, uh, this is very a similar topic. Um, you, eighty percent of your flights at least should be uh, training flights. Uh, I did that mistake um, just a few years ago. Um, <laughs> um, if you try to fly for points and results all the time, you don't learn that much. Um, you you should um, have. Um, a lot of flights where you where you just try to learn and and that should be focused learning not just um, um, yeah flying around the same mountain and, and having fun this is actual training um, it's not always fun um, it can be fun uh, if you challenge yourself but um, yeah you i see that uh, very often i i, I I experience that with with myself a lot that I that I don't invest enough time in in actual training. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, a flight for points uh, teaches you as well, but uh, a training flight uh, uh, does that much much better. And yeah, for example, um, small things like uh, watching out, looking out for birds, turmaling, you have to practice that. That doesn't come from itself. Uh, you have to practice uh, stuff like this, and uh, in you have to invest time in that. Um, it's, it's it it will improve your flights uh, on a on a very good day, where you actually uh, use all that learned stuff. And yeah, don't think because you learned something once um, that that learning will stay with you forever. You to to improve yourself, you you normally reach a plateau. Then you learn other things, and then you come back to that uh, that skill and try to uh, reanalyze and re uh, and improve that skill uh, with new with new ideas uh, that you maybe learned by improving the all the other skills. Uh, framing um, this is a, a really interesting topic. Um, um, if you you can turn pretty much anything that is scary into something that is fun and challenging and 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 interesting <laughs> um, for example uh, um, something uh, a turbulent thermal um, 
uh, you can reframe that into, um, yeah, a turbulent terminal is something um, that brings you further fast. So a turbulent ter terminal is normally a strong terminal, is, is something that helps you uh, uh, fly fast on your route. Uh, another thing I did is um, I, I um, visualized uh, flying in a turbulent terminal as as dancing with the winds, dancing with the turmoil. And this completely changed the meaning of those turbulences. And I actually enjoy turbulent turmoils, uh, strong turmoils more now than I enjoy weak turmoils. Um, this is just by reframing it. Uh, you, you change the emotional content of that thing. Uh, you reframe it and that uh, completely changes uh, how you experience um, that thing. Um, you can completely tr uh, transform something scary into something that, that makes fun, that is fun. Um, yeah, for example, altitude is absolutely your friend. It's security, it makes you glide further. So uh, embrace it if you, I, I, I wasn't so good at uh, tolerating altitude when I started flying. Um, I, I came from skydiving, uh, so I learned that there already. But for, for me, there was a, uh, yeah, a, um, a kind of altitude um, range in between uh, where I felt like um, I'm not completely safe here. But that was already uh, a range that was completely safe. Uh, at least uh, you could easily throw a reserve on that altitude. Uh, I actually felt much, much more safe uh, when I was uh, 20 meters above the ground which is completely stupid because you can't throw the reserve. Uh, you will crash into whatever you're, you're flying over. So it's, uh, it's less safe. So by reframing that, uh, something like altitude, you maybe, um, you fear of it maybe. Uh, by reframing it, um, your, your, your brain learns to actually enjoy it or to, or to uh, embrace it. Uh, same with the glider, uh, uh, a glider that shows you a lot what the air is doing in a good way uh, can be scary at first. Um, maybe it makes me makes you nervous. But um, if you uh, reframe that as, as something that uh, is very, very good for you that uh, to understand the air, uh, it changes the meaning of the, of, of the thing. And uh, it will not happen immediately. It will, it will take time. But at some point, you will actually enjoy that. Uh, you will actually, uh, uh, flying under a glider that is more damped will actually scare you after a while. Um, yeah, uh, like I already mentioned with the dopamine, um, the unknown uh, creates prediction errors and that's rewarding you with a dopamine rush. So uh, yeah, uh, fly into the unknown as, low, as long as that is uh, safe for you. Uh, of course, uh, don't switch off the brain before you do that. But um, flying into an unknown area can be super exciting, um, even if, you, if, if it scares you at first. But you can reframe it again and uh, make it something good. Uh, same for feeling, uh, f having cold uh, air higher up. Uh, uh, the best days are the days where, you, where you're sweating low, lower down at 2,000 meters. And you're freezing at 5,000. Uh, that's a super, super great day. <laughs> um, that's a record day <laughs> if it doesn't overdevelop. Um, so um, it's actually a good thing. Uh, if you frame it like that, um, you, it's much easier to get through the cold hands and, and the sweating when you're lower down. So uh, yeah, uh, it's basically what you, what you do with framing is uh, you're using your confabulation network that is between your subconsciousness and consciousness, you, you're using that in a good way. Um, it's a little bit like lying, but not really. You're just uh, reframing it to, to be of advantage to you. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's more a, a storytelling uh, thing and, and less a lying thing. Um, uh, priming, uh, another interesting thing uh, you can do. Um, um, yeah, your prediction networks, um, depending on how you prime your frame, 
uh, different prediction networks are working or are trying to make a prediction. And um, you can influence that. Um, you ca can't know which, which uh, networks are, are, are working. That is not, you have no connection to that. But um, you can kind of uh, guess uh, or trigger the right networks. For example, uh, when you say thermal, uh, then your, um, your confabulation network is actually uh, triggering the right prediction networks that look for thermals. This is a, you, you will never think that, will, that that should work, but just saying the word thermal makes it more likely that you actually find a thermal. Um, yeah, um, if you if you prime your flight for for a bigger distance, you you start to plan for 150 on a day where only 100 is possible. Uh, that make it that will still make it easier to fly 100 uh, or or yeah or more than 100. Um, it's just that that priming for something bigger that actually makes you fly bigger. Um, yeah, the, the the Skyman pose is is, a, is another kind of priming. Um, that pose alone uh, primes your brain to be in a positive mind state. Um, and uh, if your if your head is down before the takeoff and you're not sure, and your your body position is is not sure as well, uh, your brain is already primed to fail. Uh, and um, if you make the Skyman pose or uh, another positive pose, uh, your your brain is actually primed to to, to perform better, to to um, um, yeah, to be more positive, more optimistic, and do the right thing. Um, yeah, a, a turbulent day can prime you to tolerate turbulent better. Uh, Panchgani is a little bit like that. Um, it's turbulent all the time. You're kind of in the lee side uh, all the time. And um, after a few hours of flying, you, you don't even realize anymore that it's turbulent. You, you just push that bar and go through it. Um, and on other days where it's less turbulent and it's only turbulent uh, a few times in that flight, uh, you realize that much more. It's, it's, it's a kind of priming as well. Um, yeah, I, I never really use that, but I, I know this can work. Um, my, my memory for these things is good enough, so I don't have to uh, use this technique. But um, a memory palace is basically something you re really uh, know well. So, for example, in uh, the route in Bier, I flew so often, the, the one between um, Bier and Dharamshala. Um, I could use it as a memory palace. I could uh, place um, interesting, creative, funny things on top of a mountain. And I would see that for, from far away. And I would know, hey, at this mountain, I have to make altitude. For example, I'm, I'm quite impatient. Maybe that would actually work for me. So, um, yeah, when the thermal is slow, but uh, for, for, the, for the flight, it would be better to make altitude there and go to the, the, to the big range. Um, I could place uh, something funny there that, that would remind me to, to make altitude there. Um, like I said, it's a, it's a technique. Um, I'm sure it works, but I never used it. Uh, maybe it can help you. Uh, yeah, your default network. Um, when you don't uh, focus on something uh, specific, your uh, brain normally goes into the default network. And the default web network is your social network mostly. Uh, and you can use that to your advantage. Um, um, if you can use the motivation you get from doing something, uh, something great and showing that to your friends to your advantage, you, your default network is with you all the time. You you can't get rid of, of it. Um, I mean, you get rid of it when you uh, when you're completely in flow. Then your default network is switched off. Uh, but otherwise, in 80% or 90% of your life, your default net network is active. So use it to your advantage. Uh, use the motivation of friends, of um, 
of doing something impressive to um, of that of the reward system of that network to to improve yourself. Um, it's yeah, it's it's something that is there with you all the time. Uh, so it can be helpful for if you use it the right way. Uh, obstacles. Um, if something is hard to overcome, it's something you learn a lot from. So obstacles, um, you should re reframe them uh, to something good. Um, obstacles are, yeah, that, that's the, the, the base idea of, of stoicism, that you should embrace obstacles. You should uh, challenge yourself. You should, um, um, it should be fun to work on those obstacles. Um, and yeah, there are some pers personality types that have a hard time with that. Um, but um, even, even those should work on this um, because uh, the biggest improvements you have from overcoming uh, obstacles, uh, challenging obstacles, the biggest learning is from, from those. Um, there's a lot of literature on uh, stoicism. Um, uh, I, I put one of the best books in the um, in the reading list. Um, yeah, uh, further learning. Um, what I experienced uh, while learning about all this uh, brainy and mental learning stuff, um, it's the biggest Dunning-Kruger effect possible. Um, I at least three or four times I, I started writing a, a, a book on it for paragliders. Uh, for pilots uh, and every single time um, sometimes after writing 60 pages already i realized that i i i know too little about the topic to be um, uh, to be happy with the result so uh, already three or four times uh, times i started over uh, this is just natural with this um, with this topic it's uh, it's so complicated and so it has so many aspects that uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect is really, really strong in this topic. Um, yeah, um, I think you start, you know you, uh, you, you understand a lot of it when you know you understand al almost nothing. <laughs> if you have thousands, thousand questions about thousand things on this topic, then you know you came far. <laughs> Um, it's just normal in this topic. And the other thing is um, uh, try to be uh, careful with old, old knowledge on this topic. Uh, for example, pretty much everything that Freud uh, meant he found out is, is wrong, has been proven wrong. Um, and you have seen other examples in the, in the, in the myths part, uh, like the emotions, for example. For, for decades, uh, even scientists thought uh, it, uh, there are emotion blueprints. Uh, and yeah, just the last 10 years, um, everybody found out that's not the case. And they didn't even make the experiments on it to find out if the, those blueprints exist, because for them it was like completely obvious there must be blueprints for this. And um, so try to uh, read. Um, uh, current um, current uh, publications on the topic and not and be careful with with old publications and try to read stuff from uh, from actual scientists and and not really from science writers um, they they simplify uh, stuff too much and what I learned uh, with many scientists is is actually that they can write really 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 well as well. Um, yeah, there are some books that are hard to read, but uh, most of them are actually um, good reading. Um, yeah, ask me on Facebook uh, if you have questions. Um, I think I will uh, switch on a Facebook page uh, for this um, called Birdness. So we can share the knowledge and um, I can help you there. Um, yeah, I put the reading list at the end. Um, there are some books uh, on it that you will not expect. Um, there, for example, there is a book on, on economics, <laughs> on behavioral economics, but it's one of the best books on, on, 
on um, uh, biases and heuristics. Um, there is a, a book from a fighter pilot. Um, um, this is or like the I, the books I learned most from them, um, and all of them are super nice to read. Uh, I didn't put uh, books on it that are just extremely technical. Um, I think there's only one book on the read list that is actually from a pilot uh, from Mott. Um, he is like he thinks uh, on similar ways like me. He, he reads a lot and and um, he. He writes uh, about these things in his book as well, and not just about competition tactics. Um, yeah, um, what I learned, what, what helps a lot is um, um, listening to audiobooks and podcasts uh, and university lectures from the great courses on hikes. Um, uh, hiking uh, is very healthy, the, it helps you there. and. Uh, it for me it's um it's the right amount of doing something so i can focus on what's running uh what what, uh, what the audiobook is telling me uh, if i just listen to it at home um i'm always opening a browser or do something else and um uh, i don't learn as 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 well as when i walk as when i hike with, with those audiobooks uh, thanks. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, this talk is on um, is on Netlify. Um, I will probably uh, add new things to it at some uh, in the future. Uh, there is a GitHub repo uh, for the technically minded. You can um, yeah make a pull request if you have something you want to add. Why not? Um, yeah. Thanks. Wow. That was great session, Teddy. Amazing. Um, before I open up for Q and A, uh, guys, you can already start queuing up for the Q and A. I will list down a certain things uh, for Freddie. Freddie, you talked about uh, uh, not be being able to do ten thousand hours, but only uh, but we can uh, cover that up by using visualizations. Uh, why do you think visualization will work? Um, because it's a proven technique, it's, uh, there's um, research on it, and uh, yeah, it's it's found to to work really nicely. Um, Is it? Does it? Does it change the uh, the the network, the the neural network yes, within? Yes. Okay. Yes, it's um, um, as I've said at the beginning. Um, your brain, uh, all all that you experience is not a video feed or something like that. It's it's your brain um, hallucinating or or predicting um, something. And uh, if you visualize something, it's it's the same networks. Um, mm. For 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 the brain, it's kind of the same thing. Um, of course, um, like muscle memory is a little bit harder because you don't have the feedback. Um, but everything else you com can completely visualize and work on it. Okay, yeah. And, um, okay, the, the, there was one more question from one of the me members on the chat that, how does this brain rewiring affect as you, as you age? I mean, can, can, can after a certain age it starts, uh, you cannot rewire it anymore? Mm, not really, no. Um, and you, you're not really rewiring it. Uh, you do it to some point. Um, your um, long-term memory uh, creates new neurons. Um, and as you think with your uh, memories, it actually, it kind of rewires your brain. But what mostly happens is um, uh, your brain uh, removes connections. So uh, basically everything you, uh, that wasn't used in a single day is uh, removed during the night it's okay. it's marked as it's, it's marked as not in use and then it's being removed and so um um yeah th this never stops um what makes uh, old age a problem is um um you already have uh, um um very um uh, connections that are very well established like they are connected with a lot of stuff and optimized already. 
and maybe they're optimized uh, for something else that isn't useful for paragliding when you, mm. for example, when you started late mm. um, in, in your life. And uh, to actually um, rewire those things is super, super hard mm. um, because they are so, so um, connected with everything. Uh, to, to actually rewire them, you, you need to create something that, um, that works on the same inputs but is stronger than the old, the old network. So that when the prediction happens, that the new one um, overshadows the old one. Mm. But this takes a lot of work and um, it's, uh, it's super, super uh, difficult to do. Okay. Um, and but, but you can try to reframe certain things. So um, if you have a very established uh, network, uh, and you know a little bit why that network works, it, it works, the, the way it works, you can try to reframe parts of it and make it more suit, suitable to, to what you're doing. Mm. Okay. And um, we, we, we also talked about uh, setting some goals or, or also applying the techniques that, that, that we had. Um, yeah. However, knowing, knowing, all, knowing the humans, um, some of us will be able to use these techniques effectively and some of us, mm. even though they are interested to improve, but they are still not being able to uh, utilize these techniques to the fullest extent. What, wh why does it happen that only some of us can benefit from it and some of us cannot really go ahead with this, cannot really benefit that, to that extent? What is, to be do what is to be done with the brain? Yeah, it has a little bit to do with your personality type. Um, some some person personality types are just better suited to um, to work on goals um, to um, to be motivated by goals than other personality types. Um, so yeah, um, if you are a personality type that doesn't like to work on goals or overcoming obstacles or um, doing something complicated. Um, then you will have a harder time. You have to work harder on yourself to, to get to the same level uh, as somebody else. Um, that's the same thing with, that I mentioned with talent. Um, if somebody has, has that kind of personality type but a huge talent, uh, he can still become a good pilot. But when he reaches that point, that level, he has a hard time to improve after that, after that level. Um, because he's just not, he is not used to um, um, work hard on, on, on himself and on, on his flying. Um, and personality types are really, really hard to change. Um, um, you, when you know about your pers personality type, it becomes a little bit easier because you, you, when you know your disadvantages, you, you know what you have to work on. But still, motivating you on for that is 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 hard. Um, that that whoop technique, where you dream of something and then uh, sketch out the obstacles, can work even for those people. But the 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 the, the pulling motivation is is less um, because it's yeah. Your dream has to be really really strong. <laughs> uh, yeah. You have to be yeah. really really creative to that it pulls you. Yeah, and, and this creativity aspect as well. We Not all of us are as creative. I think it is also to do with these cross connections within the yes, yes. neurons that some people see colors in numbers and uh, things like that. Not all of us could see and yeah. something that comes from the infants itself. So can, can this be can this be learned as well? I mean, if if someone is not as creative in applying these techniques or with anything for that matter in life, mm -hmm. can the creativity yeah. aspect be taught? Uh, yeah, creativity is, uh, is something already quite, quite well un understood. So um, uh, basically you have to um, like uh, be less uh, controlling of yourself um, for your uh, crazier ideas to, to come into consciousness. Um, and that's something you can work on. Uh, to not be the control freak you you normally are. Um, for example, uh, myself, I'm super control freak. 
um, I have to understand something, uh, otherwise uh, I don't feel well. Um, and um, yeah, for me, just um, for me, creativity works best when I take a walk, a hike, or under the shower. When when you when my when my consciousness is switched off, then my creativity comes forward. And yeah, um, this probably works a little bit less for for extreme control freaks, but um, it it works for me. So it I, I was a control freak. I am still am, and uh, I can be creative. Okay, I open up the questions. Rakesh, I think you have questions for quite some time. Please go ahead if some of those are not answered yet. And also switch on your video, Rakesh. Uh, hold on a second. Let me, yeah, go ahead. Unmute yourself. You can unmute Rakesh. Okay. Hi, Freddy. Uh, my Hi. question is, uh, how to use this uh, understanding of uh, how the brain functions to bounce back mentally after a crash or a scary uh, or a traumatic incident? Um, because I, I, I laid the fundament in each initially to, I know that those things can happen and will happen. And um, I, I prepare for that initially already uh, in that um, um, I know when that happens and I get out of it un unhurt. Uh, it's a good opportunity to learn from. So I'm already reframing that thing uh, to be more positive. And um, I know that when you uh, suppress those memories and those experiences, um, it can haunt you for the rest of your life. And you have no chance to to get rid of it anymore. Uh, that's PTSD, <laughs> um, uh, the trauma disorder. Um, so knowing that in in advance, uh, when something happens, um, I try to work on it immediately. Um, uh, if it happens on a landing, um, I try to go flying immediately again, if possible to get that out of my head, not to get it, not to suppress it, but to, to process it. Uh, and you could, can do that best when you make another landing um, and, and then analyze it uh, at the end of the day. Um, there will be scary moments uh, in our sport. Um, you, this will be always like this. Um, I mean, this Monday, I was super scared when I was flying backwards on my house uh, hill in super turbulent um, and thermic air. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm learning from it. I'm, I'm trying to analyze what I did wrong or uh, why I took off in, in that strong wind. Um, um, yep. Yeah. But it, it's, it, will be, it will be part of our sport all the time. You will not get rid of it. You better learn to frame it correctly and to analyze it so that you learn something from it. Use it as something positive, like it happened. So probably it happens like every two years. <laughs> so now for the next two years, it should be okay. <laughs> and learn something from it. Cool, cool. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, next question is from Alan. Alan, if you want, you can go ahead. Okay, Freddie, how do you differentiate between reframing and uh, visualization? Um, yeah, framing is, is changing the meaning, the, the, the emotional content of something. Uh, visualization is actually it, it's it's the same thing as practicing just um, in your brain uh, without actually doing it. But um, it's it's the closest thing you can practice uh, something without actually doing it. Um, it's not the same thing. Framing is something um, creative. You have to um, trans. Um, you have to change something scary into something that is. Uh, that is 
of, of a, what <laughs> that if of some uh, different emotional content it's 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 something different it's not the same okay got it thank you okay uh, let's look who are okay uh, i think navin chetri navin you can go ahead and mute yourself hello can you hear me yeah navin go ahead yes. uh hello freddy uh, i have a Hi. question like do some kind of exercises help your improve like improve your flying or reaction time like mental or uh, physical exercises like uh, if you start to learn juggling or some balancing exercises does they have yeah. effect on the flying um i'm i'm not completely sure about it um there is probably some reaction time limit that is set by your brain you can't change that um like a lower limit um but because um you have prediction networks and you can optimize them with with uh, with training and uh, optimized prediction networks can uh, can act faster so you can improve your reaction times um when i was uh, flying in kenya uh kenya is um is a game of reaction time uh, as simple as that um you're flying full bar all the time close to the ridge and you have uh, in the middle of the day you have um uh, up to 9 meter thermals uh, on that ridge so you're basically uh, working on your reaction time the the ball every day and um yeah i got so fast with reaction time uh, flying on that ridge that for me it was just um, stepping out uh, at the beginning of the of the thermal of on the steep speed bar and right back in uh, i did it so precisely at the at the border of the thermal that um, that it was just an automatism um and you actually there was probably even something you felt uh, unconsciously before the thermal that that you don't feel consciously that helped to already trigger that that prediction and then it was just uh, working just just yeah doing its prediction and 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 triggering the behavior and i think yeah you can through training you can reduce your reaction time with yeah in in those situations but you i think your base reaction time is is pretty much fixed okay okay that's okay that answers a lot thank you okay um next is sarang rathor i'm not sure if he's still there sarang if you are still there then otherwise i can ask his question um his question was more on um when we refer to visualization technique what's the recommended approach when should it be done and how many times uh, a day and what's the best way you recommend yeah it's just one and the same thing what's what's the best way to you recommend to visualize okay yeah good question um uh, as often as you can <laughs> um <laughs> uh for example try to um um do the weather uh, every day and uh, then the next day um Uh, take a flight from the next day with that knowledge back in your head what the weather was and uh, maybe you you watched the weather again on that day and yeah put that flight into google earth or whatever and um then visualize that flight and um yeah um your brain actually uh remembers what you learned in that visual visualization best when it's as close to the real thing as possible so i never tried that out but um i'm pretty sure it would help uh, is when you put um um a ventilator in front of you so you have the wind in your face and you have the noise of the wind because your brain is storing um everything that you experienced in that uh, in that moment together so what you're smelling what your um, other senses are telling you 
um, that all all of that uh, is is combined into that memory, into that into that experience. And if that is as close as possible to the experience you later have while you fly, so the wind noises, maybe even if you can do that somehow, the various noises. Um, if you the closer you are to the real thing, the easier you it is for for your brain to remember the learnings to trigger the, the same predictions again. Makes sense. And um, Rohit is, uh, I think Rohit has also, uh, Rohit, go ahead, yeah. Hi, Freddy, uh, great talk. Uh, a quick question, and I think many pilots would have the question in the mind. Uh, imagine yourself a standard weekend pilot with about 70, 80 hours a year, and not more than two to three weeks of alpine flying, which all these scales are way off to some of the like 300 hours and a month in B. Not many can do that for various reasons. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure there are a lot of techniques that you have mentioned. Some of them are still extremely helpful to guys like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you just put yourself in the shoe for a moment and think how we can improve ourselves? Yeah, I think it's just your goals are different. Maybe you, your goal is um, having as much fun as possible on my house site. Uh, and then your goal is um, you're not training for results. You're training to, to be as skilled and to, be as, as, to feel everything as pleasurable as possible. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. You, it's still training. Maybe 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 you have a day that, where you fly from one small hill to uh, or one small um, uh, peak to to another one one kilometer away, and you do that uh, twenty times, and you you learn from it. That's maybe a little bit boring to you, but it will help you uh, the ne next time you you're flying to 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 have more pleasure because it's it's. You, you learned something doing it. Um, yeah, for, for me, for example, um, one of the main motivations um, going cross country at the beginning was not uh, uh, the points or the records or anything like that. Uh, the motivation was uh, I, I love nature. I, I love being uh, out in the mountains and um, um, I, I love new, seeing new things and uh, learning about cross country flying. Um, uh, the motivation at the beginning was to see new things, to, to, to be able to fly further because then I see more, I see further. Great that, was the main, that was the main motivation. Uh, the points and results was completely not even secondary. It was not important at first. A great answer, Freddie. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Um, next in line is Bhushan. Bhushan, go ahead. I think you have a couple of questions. Uh, sorry, I have a bad network. I just have one question. I'll ask it. Uh, is mm -hmm. it subconscious competence or is it unconscious competence? Previously, that was a just a nitpicking question in my mind. But I'd like to know if you, Freddie, see a difference between subconscious and unconscious. Um, well, um, your consciousness can be uh, right and wrong. Uh, there are some things your subconsciousness is, is much better than your consciousness. And, and the, the main thing you should find out is where is your consciousness uh, really good at informing you at, at doing the uh, where it's actually good from the beginning, even without much experience to listen to your subconsciousness, to your instincts and where it's completely not good. Um, uh, learning about all those biases helped me to make those decisions. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm normally more, uh, a, a, an analytic guy anyway so for me it's more i had had to learn more to trust my my instincts more than the other way around uh, but of course i i trust the instincts i know i have trained them and um, they 
from I know from experience that they are telling me the right thing. So it's it's like you have to not uh, just blindly accept um, one part or the other. You uh, both can be right, both can be wrong. You have to like learn which one are are the correct ones uh, at the right time. Did that help? Um, uh, actually, no, because my question was okay. more on the lines of, uh, I understand conscious competence. That is, we decide, yeah. we analyze, like you said, analytical mind deciding what to do. Yes. Then there is uh, a mind uh, which works on the flow, which you mentioned. Yes. So yeah, you mentioned exactly. it to be a subconscious mind. Yes. And, and I'm referring uh, Kelly Farina's book, which uh, mentions unconscious competence, which always, you know, uh, seemed odd to my ears, because I always associated unconscious as something uh, uh, physical as well. Whereas subconscious, which means something like I'm walking on the road and uh, I by default go towards the store that I want to without thinking about it. So that is subconscious in my yes. understanding. Do you see yes. subconscious in the same context uh, that is uh, um, different from unconscious? That was my question. Um, everything that happens in all the decision you think you or most of the decisions you think you make with your consciousness are actually made by your sub subconsciousness. 90% um, of everything that happens, um, especially while flying and stuff like that, where you focused, is your subconsciousness. Um, and uh, your consciousness is, is a very, very um, thin layer that takes a lot of energy because it has to um, work on very, very complex and, and, and planning stuff. But um, it's actually an, an illusion that your consciousness is doing a lot. Um, um, most decisions are, are, are being done by your subconsciousness and your subconsciousness does a lot more than you think. Uh, and not, on, not only simple things. Um, um, it just tries to um, like create an algorithm out, out of everything. Um, yeah, something automatic out of everything. But that doesn't mean that has to be something super simple. And the word you use to describe that is subconscious or unconscious, or are those words same to you? Yeah, the same thing for me. Yeah. Okay. And that answers my question. Thanks. Okay. Are there uh, any more questions, guys? Okay. I think no. Freddie, I think it was a great session. And oh, uh, the more people great. deep, yeah, the more people deep dive into it, the more they are going to learn about it. I don't think. Uh, um, but then it, it, it needs a repetition, the way you talked about earlier. Yes. People will have to go through it multiple times. Yeah, and, of course. Uh, it, 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 it took me eight years and, yes. a lot of, and a lot of learning in those eight years to come to all these conclusions. Yeah. And some of them will be wrong. So some of them I will think uh, in, in another two years that it's the wrong explanation. Or Yeah, it's, it's a constant learning experience. But um, it already helped me in the, in the past um, years uh, a lot. I overcome so many obstacles and like, like the, the valley crossing thing that, that we mentioned at the beginning. Um, it, it, it made me overcome all those things. So it's, uh, and and it, was, it was a pleasure to, to learn about all those things. Um, I'm, I'm already looking forward today to go uh, hike again and, and put an audio book in. That's a great one, Freddie. Um, I, on behalf of everyone, I, th and I thank you because I, the session has been more than two and a half hours, I guess, and uh, we've been on the call all, all, for <laughs> so long. And I th thank all the participants as well who stood with us for so long. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Alok. And thank you, Freddie. Thank you very much. Uh, this is nice. Very nice. All of you thank can you, unmute Freddy. yourself. Thank yeah? you, Alok. Thank you, Freddy. Thank you a lot. Thanks, Freddy. Thanks, Alok. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Freddy. Thank you, Alok, for such a nice. Thank you, Freddy. Thank you, Alok. Thank you.
Thank you, Freddy. Thank you, Alok. Thank you, Freddy. Thank you, Alok. Thank you, Flying Stories. Thank you, Alok and Freddy. This is a great system. I'm stopping the recording.